Vortragsreihe zum Machine Learning in den, im Bildungsbereich. Wir haben die, diese Reihe über das Interdisziplinäre Zentrum für Bildungsforschung organisiert, deren Direktor ich bis November letzten Jahres noch war. Und eigentlich sollte die Vortragsreihe auch im, bis zum Ende letzten Jahres abgeschlossen sein. Dann kam die Pandemie dazwischen, sodass wir es vor der Pandemie nur geschafft hatten, den Kickoff zu machen. Wir hatten David Stilbel Ende Januar letzten Jahres hier in Berlin, der uns einen sehr interessanten, spannenden, einführenden Vortrag gegeben hat, der sich auch viel über Ethik der ganzen Sache gedreht hat. Heute ist es mir eine besondere Freude, Clemens Stachel begrüßen zu können. Der Titel der, des Vortrags steht auch schon eingeblendet. Ich will gar nicht so viel von deiner Zeit wegnehmen. Ich will aber wenigstens noch ein paar Sachen zu dir sagen, damit alle ein besseres Bild vielleicht haben oder ein klareres Bild. Du hast 2005 in dem schönen Ort Eisenerz Abitur gemacht, was für die Kenner unter uns und die Kennerinnen schon mal zeigt, dass das in Österreich ist. Und das ist aber auch an keinem normalen Gymnasium gewesen, sondern das ist ein, eine Projektschule gewesen mit einem innovativen Schulkonzept, habe ich gelesen, wo man nämlich neben der Matura, also dem Abitur, auch eine Berufsausbildung machen kann. Und wenn man auf die Webseite dieser Schule geht, sieht man, dass dort Technik, IT, Coding offensichtlich, zumindest heute, ob es damals schon so war, aber sehr zentral ist. Also hier hat eine frühe Warnung stattgefunden. Du hast dann Psychologie studiert in Graz, hast 2012 deinen Magister dort abgelegt und hast in der Studiumszeit Praktika gemacht im neuropsychologischen Bereich. Du warst aber auch bei Daimler im Bereich Human Factors und du hast einen längeren Auslandsaufenthalt gemacht in Kalifornien. Da scheint es dich dann immer wieder hin zu ziehen und warst dort an der California State University in East Bay, Hayward, im Bereich auch Human Factors und Engineering. Dann hast du dich entschieden zu promovieren und hast, und das ist, glaube ich, gar nicht so gewöhnlich und wirklich aller Ehren wert, auch die Finanzierung mit selbst eingeworben durch ein Praxisprojekt mit Audi und hast dort dann während deiner Promotionszeit als Graduate Student Researcher gearbeitet mit der Aufgabenbeschreibung Applied Thesis Work and Consulting. Das ist sicherlich was, was man mal bei Gelegenheit besprechen kann, vielleicht nicht heute was da so äh, gemacht wurde. Du hast 2017 promoviert bei Markus Bühner an der LMU im Bereich Psychologie und Statistik und warst dann bis 2019 Postdoc an der LMU. Und eigentlich würdest du seit 2019 jetzt Postdoc sein im Department of Communication, Media and Personality Lab von Gabriela Harari in Stanford. Aber auch das ist Corona-bedingt zwar deine berufliche Tätigkeit, aber nicht dein, dein Wohnsitz leider. Was noch zu erwähnen ist, glaube ich, du hast bereits 2013, also kurz auch nach deinem Magister, ein Projekt gestartet in München als Gründer. Das nennt sich Phone Study Mobile Sensing Project und da sind Mitglieder des Departments für Psychologie, aber auch der Informatik und der Computerwissenschaften der LMU drin integriert. Das ist ein relativ großes Projekt, was du auch federführend mitgestaltet hast, was ich sehr beeindruckend finde. Das drückt sich auch in, dein, in deiner Publikationsstrategie aus. Man sieht hier also einschlägig psychologische Papiere, man sieht aber auch Papiere in eher Schnittflächen, interdisziplinären Schnittflächen. Deswegen ist es auch, eine willkommene, bist auch ein willkommener Gast hier bei uns im interdisziplinären Zentrum. Und was ich ganz besonders beeindruckend finde, das Thema oder die Methodik, die du hier beackerst, dieses Machine Learning und Artificial Intelligence, ist sehr sicherlich was, was viele von uns irgendwie ständig hören oder zumindest ab und zu hören und wo jeder mal sagt, das könnte interessant sein. Das, was ich besonders finde, ist, Clemens, dass du das nicht nur verstehst und beherrschst und anwendest, sondern dass es dir auch ein großes Anliegen ist, nicht nur innerhalb des Feldes für Standards zu, zu sorgen, sondern dieses Feld auch zu vergrößern. Das sieht man daran, wie aktiv du bist, Workshops zu geben mit einführenden Themen, aber auch vertiefenden Themen zu Machine Learning und immer mit einem Hands-on-Element, sodass du die Leute schnell dazu bringst, sicherlich unter Berücksichtigung der ganzen K-Werts, die du einführst, aber trotzdem schnell dazu bringst, mit eigenen Daten auch tatsächlich diese Methoden auszuprobieren. Und das finde ich ganz wichtig und ganz beeindruckend. Und ich fand es auch ganz lustig, als ich letztens auf der Couch fand und dann gebe ich dir gleich das, das Wort auf der Couch, dass meine Frau sagte, schau mal hier, das ist doch mal eine Forschung, die du machen könntest und sie reichte mir die Seite aus Zeitwissen wieder und ich sage, ja, 
habe es zwar nicht gemacht, aber ich kenne den, der es gemacht hat. Und es war ganz schön, dass also deine Forschung sich auch da niederschlägt. Und äh, ja, lieber Clemens, ich freue mich auf deinen Vortrag. Und wir haben abgemacht, dass du ihn auf Englisch halten wirst, weil wir einige Zuhörer haben, die den gerne auf Englisch hören würden und besser verfolgen können. Deswegen, the stage is yours, Clemens. Thank you very much, Matthias. Uh, very kind words. Uh, I feel very humbled. Um, yes, so thank you, first of all, for having me and for giving me a chance to um, talk uh, about my research. Um, it feels like you have already summed up pretty much almost everything, but I'm going to go a little bit more into the, in the depth here. Um, yes, I'm going to talk about mobile sensing, or I'm going to talk about, if my keyboard works, about... Can you see the slides? Okay, great. No, okay, so I will talk about, I'll try to cut this down as much as possible, um, about four things in general. Uh, personality traits, because that's, uh, um, Matthias said that before I did that, uh, area of research where I have spent most of my time in, at least in academic settings. Um, human behavior, that's, I think, the most common element that is going through all my research efforts that I've done so far because I'm most fascinated by how people behave, uh, especially in their natural environments and um, what we can learn from uh, analyzing and um, collecting data on human behavior. I'm going to talk about smartphones because smartphones will be one of the methodologies uh, that I'm going to introduce today and that I'm using throughout my research. Um, and machine learning, uh, Matthias was talking about that already, that's kind of like interwined in the whole talk um, as a methodology, that I'm, uh, a modeling technique that I, I, I try to use as much as possible. And I also, I'm very, I like it very much to, to model data that way. Let's start off with personality. Um, I do that usually because um, not everybody who's listening to this talk might be familiar with personality. Uh, it's a word that everybody has heard before and that we're using in our daily lives, but it's not exactly what um, we understand in terms of personality when we talk about it in a scientific context, especially in, in psychology. And so here's one definition. It's a, a very broad definition. It's by the American Psychological, Psychological Association, what we can understand when we talk about personality. And they say on their website, personality refers to individual differences in characteristic patterns of thinking, feeling, and behaving. Some, sometimes you can also add to that definition relatively stable patterns in, in those things, but that's a common definition. And one, maybe the most, probably the most uh, widely used and most popular model in personality psychology when it comes to traits is the big five personality taxonomy or the five factor model. Sometimes it's all called ocean model, which basically is only related to the first letters of the, uh, the dimensions that are uh, at the very top in this taxonomy. Namely, openness to experience, basically how open are people to new experiences, to new ideas, to new values and norms. Conscientiousness, which is a dimension that broadly describes how reliable you are as a person, how orderly and uh, how dutiful you maybe are um, in your daily life. <clears throat> Extraversion is a dimension that is probably most intuitive to everybody here. Um, and it, it describes in a broad, very broad uh, way how communicative, uh, sociable, but also assertive and cheerfulness somebody is. Agreeableness is a dimension that relates to how, how nice it is actually to get along with that person. So do you take into account the needs of others above yours sometimes and how often do you do that? Those things will be um, uh, described in that uh, dimension. Neuroticism, emotional stability, the last dimension um, basically is the one dimension that is in extreme forms most closely related to pathological, uh, psychological phenomena, but not in this dimension. So that, uh, not in this taxonomy, that's also something to mention. So all the personality descriptions we get from the big five are basically in the normal range of, of personalities of people. <clears throat> but getting back to emotional stability, it describes how 
um, how resistant you are, for example, to stressful stimuli, how, um, <clears throat> how self-conscious you are, those kind of things. And uh, what's also worth mentioning at this point is that the Big Five taxonomy is a hierarchical taxonomy. So it's basically, it has been created from uh, all the words in, in dictionaries that people use to describe other people uh, in terms of thinking, feeling, and behaving. Um, and you can aggregate those words using the right methods. Uh, factor analysis was a method the researchers used back then uh, to derive uh, combinations of those smaller entities to arrive at these broad domain factors of personality. This is too short introduction to personality, but this is as much as I can give today to create a, a common understanding of what I will talk about when I mention personality traits. One thing to also add to this maybe that is helpful to understand why we actually think about that at all is what are reasons for why we investigate personality traits in psychology and other sciences as well. Um, one aspect that we hear quite often is that personality is related to important life outcomes. So for example, uh, relationship stability, work performance, criminal activity, relationship, uh, oh, we had that already, relation satisfaction. So basically, um, if you know the personality of a person, you to some word, some degree can anticipate what that person likely will, what life that person will likely have. Um, and in more concrete terms, what personality is also really useful for is it's a very efficient description of a person. So um, if you know a person's personality trait, traits or you know how that person is, if, you, if it's a friend of yours, you're able to describe that person with, give them attributes, assign attributes to that person. And then uh, you can just say he's an extrovert or he's an agreeable person. And you can anticipate a lot from that already. For example, how will that neurotic person probably behave in that stressful situation? Will that person be a good person um, to work as a um, uh, as a car seller, for example, salesman. Matthias has done some work on this, um, but I'm not going to go into uh, into that in more details. Um, but that's in in a nutshell why personality. Th those are two reasons why personality is something important to investigate. Behavior. That's the second point I, I was talking about. Uh, behavior uh, is a broad word. In, in the social sciences, because it can mean so many different things. So, and it also, different people mean different things when they talk about behavior. So one thing people mean when they say behavior, and that has happened a lot in, 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 in the social sciences, in the educational sciences, um, in psychology foremost, is they actually talk about asking people about how they think, how they wanna tell us, how they behave. So it's very common to ask in questionnaires, uh, how do you typically behave in that situation? Uh, what did you do uh, yesterday, the day before yesterday, last week, last year? What do you think how often you do those things? So that's uh, a very easy, uh, self-reports a very easy way to collect data on how people supposedly uh, behave. But there are also problems associated with that type of uh, data collection methodology, um, and those are numerous. So first of all, um, people might not always tell us exactly what they do, you know. They might have a social desirability bias when they give us their answers. So they might not wanna tell us that they are cheating on their partner, for example. Um, or they will basically give answers that are more social desirable than others. And they might do that uh, consciously or unconsciously. Faking is another is another um, hot term that Matthias has also done a, a lot of work on. Um, it's basically giving deliberately giving wrong answers. So, for example, uh, thinking about a you know setting where you're applying for a job, and then you are asked to fill out the personality questionnaire. Um, you might want to you know be seen in a very positive light when you do so, although you might be actually a lazy person and. Uh, but you're not gonna, you know, answer uh, in in that questionnaire in that way. 
there are ways to deal with all those things. Uh, and there is also a myriad of other things such as response styles, people crossing, for example, at the very extremes of a scale or always at the middle or always tend to, uh, you know, agree to statements rather than disagree. And those are all in all not really controllable. So there's a problem there. It's, it's, a, it's a good way to get uh, data on fast data on behavior, but that data is not, not necessarily the exact data we want to have. But what's the alternative to that? The alternative is we can put people in lab environments and we can uh, give them behavioral tasks and see how they respond and then try to um, you know, generalize what we find in that controlled lab environment to the real world out there. But also that is problematic because usually and very often those results we find in the lab do not generalize the complex uh, reality we all live in. So what I think what we actually want to have as, as researchers in, in the social sciences interested in, in, in naturalistic behaviors, we want to have behavior uh, as it happens in the real world with all the influences that are potentially, um, uh, you know, have, playing their forces on, on behavior in the wild. So what we actually want is we want to have behavior as it naturally occurs um, with a lot of uh, influences and not uh, a behavior as people report it, and also not behavior uh, in a situation where people know they are being observed while, while doing so. Um, this, and now I'm getting to the, to the point uh, of, of the talk today, um, this is getting easier now. It has been hard for a very long time because of the, the reasons that I mentioned before, but uh, it's getting easier now, luckily, because behavior in the wild these days often looks, as you can see it on this picture, um, people are somewhere, but many of their behaviors um, are actually happening on a single device. And that's the smartphone people carry around with them throughout their days, throughout their normal lives. So these days you, you think about what you're doing on your smartphone. Uh, you can do things you have done years before at a certain place at a certain point in time. So you would have you would transfer money at the bank. You would go to a store to buy something. You would uh, meet some people in a bar and date a person uh, in a bar or somewhere or meet somebody. Now this all happens online or it can happen online. Um, and there's a, a myriad of apps out there that enable you to do things from this central device, which you would usually do at a different location, a different setting, a different context. It doesn't mean that everything happens on that device, but it's a large fraction of what people are doing um, uh, in their days. Um, so coming to the to the conclusion, this is this is basically this has basically triggered the business model of the digital economy that we are seeing uh, now that we are living in now. So basically, all we do because it happens at that device creates uh, a vast amount of data. Uh, and it can, it's also possible to collect a lot of data on what people do, when they do something, where they do something, how frequently, how regularly they do something in, the con in certain contexts. And that is used to sell stuff to people, to target people with ads, um, and also just to sell that data to different people without you ever knowing what happens. But, and that's, that's the sunny side, uh, that also means that we as researchers, we can do that as well. And we can do it uh, in, in, in a way where we respect people's privacy and under ethical considerations. So the term that I'm going to use in this talk is called mobile sensing. There's different terms like digital phenotyping and so forth, but I'm going to use that one. Uh, it basically refers to um, the method of using um, consumer electronics or formally specifically developed devices to automatically collect data about people's contexts, about people's situations, about people's environments, and most of all, their behaviors. Um, and why would you do that? Because, as I just said, those consumer electronics that we are um, uh, that we're using, in particular a smartphone, um, is basically 
it, it works like a lens of our behaviors that are channeled through it. But what's good as well about um, smartphones in particular is that they are equipped with an array of sensors that in addition to what we do um, can be used to gather further information, further data about what's happening around that person, around that device in close or, or not so close proximity. Um, furthermore, um, smartphones are actually small computers these days. So it's really, they're pretty high performant. They are much more performant than the computers I have been using as a desktop uh, just a couple of years ago. They're constantly connected to the internet and they are relatively cheap to buy. And actually everybody has one. And so it's actually a perfect tool for collecting data for research purposes and also processing data already on the go. If you wanna use that in your own research, those are some of the available um, platforms. There are a couple of open source projects such as the AWARE framework and the Bailey framework. Um, but there is also commercial um, mobile sensing frameworks such as Xana Health or Ethica, which um, you, know, you can use as a researcher um, um, as a service. These are some of the data that you can collect with mobile sensing methods. This is by far is not everything you can collect, but this is um, these are roughly the most important uh, categories. So I always try to um, to categorize the data that we are collecting in our studies into usage logs, which is basically just text that is uh, created with a program when something happens on the device. So for example, if you open your, if you open WhatsApp, then you have a little program and that would write um, down, uh, this guy opened up WhatsApp at 1245 uh, at that location and so forth. So that's what the, a usage log and you can create those for all different things like screen activity, calls, battery, music, and so forth. We're gonna hear about, more about that later. The sensors I talked about before already, they give you additional data about the environment. So where is that phone? What's happening in the environment? Is it very loud? You can get that from the microphone, for example. Um, is it a dark environment, which might be something if you're interested in sleep research, for example, uh, you could combine these sensors also. For example, is it loud? Is it, is it quiet and dark? And is it late at night? Um, those kind of things. And then uh, what's really great from a research perspective about this data is that you can get these from the phone, but then you can additionally uh, enrich the data with uh, databases that already exist in the, in, in the web uh, through APIs, through application programming interfaces. For example, music, uh, you can get from the phone. We're gonna hear about that later, but you can enrich it with additional information. And of course, what you can also do if your study is running on the phone, you can also ask questions, which we have already, which we have been doing for a very long time. And that can be very informative about things like how people feel or how people think about certain things. Um, just to give you an idea how the data looks like you get out of this, um, this is uh, as like a short excerpt from uh, uh, one participant, which we collected like, data on in 2014. Um, and this is just here for you to give you a granularity idea of what, what's happening. So what do you, about the behavior that we can observe on that phone? So what you can see here, for example, at, if you're starting from the top, I think, you, I hope you can see my um, arrow. What's happening here, it's, it's 6.45 in the morning. The phone is locked. And then what's happened is the screen is going on, but it's still locked and the screen goes off again. Um, what's happening then is the screen is on, it's locked, but then the person unlocks the phone. Um, and this could be something, could be interpreted as checking your phone before the alarm goes off. And that's supported by the data that follows. So uh, what we can see here, for example, is that um, a person is going to the home screen. That's the home screen app for a certain type of phone. And then it's going to the UA app, which is the clock, alarm clock app, back to the home screen. Um, and then what's happening, and, then, and why, why I think this is the case that the person actually turned off the alarm before it went off because the person went to the home screen before he actually went to the, the clock app. If the clock app would go to foreground because the alarm goes off, you would see that immediately in, in the logs. 
uh, what happens then is the person turns off the airplane mode, which he had on at night. Wi-Fi goes on. He's connected to the internet. And then the usual thing happens, checking mails, checking Facebook, um, and also plugs in the phone for charging. So this is just an example but to give you an idea of at what granularity, granularity uh, that method allows us to investigate human behavior in the wild as it happens. This also takes me, this granularity takes me to uh, the most important point, which I'm getting more and more concerned about because more and more people are starting to use these methods. Um, of course, you can imagine um, that kind of data gives you a very detailed record of what people do, when they do it, and where they live, their habits, their um, residence, and you could potentially identify people from that data. So what you need to make sure is when you run these studies is that you, first of all, are you know, conform with GDPR requirements. If you collect any health or mental health data, HIPAA or uh, those more strict um, regulations that are used for medical data. And you have to prevent that the data can be used for uh, misuse by third parties. There's a, there are a thir certain number of countermeasures. Those are definitely not all that we are, um, you know, applying, but those are the most important ones and some that you should consider if you do that yourself. Encrypting the data if you transfer it, hashing information that you don't need in that granularity. So, for example, you don't need, mostly don't need names or numbers or addresses locked. You can just hash those into an identifiable string number combination um, that will allow you to, for example, investigate if a person is calling different people or the same person all the time, but it will not allow anybody to uh, basically find out who he called. And then another thing that's uh, getting increasingly important is on-device processing. So basically not just uploading the raw data uh, to your server, for example, audio data, but to extract what uh, you can already on the device. So using the phone, not only as a data gatherer, but also as a data processing um, device. And of course you need uh, for storing any kind of data that has been collected that way, a secure uh, data management and storage plan with uh, fallback options if certain things happen. So if you're hacked, what are you gonna do next? How many hours do you have time to react to that? How are you gonna sh make sure that the data is, uh, is uh, protected at a certain point in, in time? Uh, but that's just like a very short excerpt. So now we're getting into actual, in, in the actual research that I've been doing with that method. And I've, my research has mostly been focused, Matthias said that before, on uh, personality traits um, and behavior. With the uh, mobile sensing method, you can collect, I, I, you have seen that on the slide before, are a range of behaviors that are happening, happening differentially often. So for example, uh, you know, SMS are not happening as often as uh, your GPS logs or the screen goes on. Screen is of course highly correlated with um, app usage. But the only thing I wanna show you here actually at this slide is that it gives you a very good method to collect continuous data over very long periods of time uh, in a very large sample. For example, here from January to May. Um, one of the uh, most interesting behaviors, I think, uh, to investigate is app usage behavior. And that's related to, uh, especially if you're interested in individual differences in personality, because uh, there's so much variation in there. And there are so many things you can do um, with apps on your phone. There's an app for everything. Um, so for example, here um, you have an app for too good to go for um, buying food that would be thrown away otherwise or SnowSafe, an app for checking uh, the avalanche danger in the Alps uh, if you wanna do a ski hike. So those are my apps for my phone, so that's so, so you know. Uh, but there is all kinds of apps that uh, you could use. And so what that means is there is a large range of individual difference in those, in the, in the, the, in the first of all, the types of app people use and how they use these apps. What we found, uh, and that's what we found also in the, in the first study that I, I ran on, on, the, on, on mobile sensing data, we found that demographic factors, personality traits, and also fluid intelligence for one type of apps seems to be predictive for using uh, 
apps in certain categories more often or less often and for longer or shorter periods of time. For example, we found that extroverts use more or call people more often, use photography apps, apps more often, or use apps related to communication more often. And to just say one more thing about the fluid intelligence thing, um, lifestyle apps is kind of, it's an ambiguous category, but uh, Tinder was the most uh, often used app in that uh, category. So I, I wouldn't, you know, um, I wouldn't generalize those findings readily because they were in a small 140 people sample. But this is what we found in, in, in our sample in this first approach to uh, individual differences in app usage. The most important behavior, I think, in the social sciences and in psychology in particular, is communication and social behavior. And the smartphone gives you a, a lot of opportunities to investigate that data with that, uh, well, through the tech technological lens of the smartphone. So, for example, you can. Um, collect data on communications, like conversations that are happening around the device. And that works in a way that you are taking data from the microphone, and then you would have a, a model, a statistical model running on the phone that will detect if in that audio signal, there is likely a conversation happening. You could also directly um, log calls as they happening on the phone. So for example, if people are calling that person or if that person is calling other people and which kind of, how often do they call different people, for example. Communication apps, we heard about that before. Um, and this is what we also looked at also in this first paper, but then in a more extensive uh, paper where I was glad to be a co-author on, uh, where Gabriel Harari had like the most descriptive and extensive work on sociability behaviors as measured with the smartphone. If you're interested in that, I encourage you to, to read that paper. It's really hard to take one single result because it's a very descriptive paper. But for example, one thing we found in there is that extroverted people are, or more extroverted people are showing higher frequencies and durations for all these um, activities here that I just mentioned. In addition to uh, you know counting frequencies and durations of certain behaviors of a certain class, language also gives you the opportunity to look at it in more detail. So you can, for example, uh, take the conversation here from this chat with Florian Pagent, um, uh, which is a friend and collaborator of mine, um, and you could analyze that text further. So you can either use the raw text or, and that's what we did in our studies, you can on the device classify uh, the language data into dictionary categories. For example, Luke, which is pretty popular in psychology, um, or you can have even language models run on the phone to um, to adequately um, model the, the context in the language as well. And emoji are one thing that give you a very good uh, opportunity to have emotional or maybe even cognitive aspects or information pieces in your data that you can extract from, from the conversations. And there's a work in, in revision now where we have, we have basically looked at WhatsApp chats uh, and then tried to predict um, demographic characteristics from there and investigate which language features are most informative about it. Language use, I, I'm gonna skip this uh, slide because uh, I, I talked about that before. So you can extract audio features on the phone. Um, that's everything I wanna say here. Um, and you can use these features for, for modeling later while not having to save the raw audio file. Mobility behavior is another thing that's really interesting um, because you take your phone everywhere. So you can basically, this is data from, uh, from mobile sensing studies we ran in Munich when I was working at the LMU. Um, and those are uh, all the GPS positions from, from all the participants um, over, the course of three studies, which all took around one month in total. Um, and GPS data is not that, um, has not been that popular in psychology so far, but that now there's a lot of uh, work happening because you can basically um, relate that data to places people go and try to find out what are the characteristics of those places that people go to. And also on more broad terms, uh, mobility behavior has been 
related to depressive symptoms in the past, which I mentioned before uh, is something that in, if in extreme forms is related to emotional stability or neuroticism, looking at it from the personality angle. Um, music listening behavior is another interesting type of behavior that uh, there has been a lot of research on, so also in, in the personality realm. So uh, there have been stable associations being found between extroversion openness. Uh, for example, extroverts se seem to like, um, you know, pop music more than less extroverted people on average, and more open people seem to prefer more complex music such as jazz or classic music. Now, what the phone gives us, the opportunity the phone gives us is first of all, see where people, in which context people listen to certain types of music. And what we catch, can get from the phone is, we can basically get uh, the band, the song and the album that song is from. And if we take that information, we can analyze how many different songs the person has listened to. Um, but it's kind of hard to, um, you know, basically make a statement about what types of music somebody listens to. So what the idea that we had is uh, what you can do with that data is you can use the combination of artist title album to go to APIs. So for example, Spotify, and then for each and every song, get all the text that is in that song. And you can get a uh, objective description of the music characteristics of that song. And that's also a paper um, uh, we are we're working on at the moment where we, in addition to those music features, we also have the text of the song and try to find out if the text of the song is actually related to the personality of the listener. Um, the behaviors I talked about before are very specific, but I think what the phone is also really good at is looking at very broad and basal behaviors. And one of the most basal, uh, basic behaviors uh, people show is being awake and not being awake. Basically sleeping or not sleeping because you have to sleep every once in a while. And there's also a, a mountain of research from biology, medicine that has looked at how people differ with regard to when they go to bed, when they get up. And that's a so-called chronotype literature. Uh, and those, the literature always talks about this binary distinction between um, chronotypes, uh, between people who go to bed early and people who go to bed late. But what we find in our research, uh, if we take these objective measures from the phone, so basically, when do you put your phone away in the evening? Because that's usually the last thing people do. And when do you take it up in the morning? If we take that as a proxy for when people are sleeping or inactive, I should say, at night, we don't find these chronotypes. We find a continuous distribution of some people go a bit later, some people wake up earlier and so, and so forth. And we find uh, correlations with behaviors. For example, conscientious people go early to bed, get up early. Open people seem to use snoozing on their alarm clock more often than less open people. Extroverts seem to check their phone more often at night and emotionally stable people go to bed later and sleep in a little bit. But those correlations are all in, in the um, you know, 0 0.15, 0 0.20 range. So if you're interested in that, and there's a lot more in that paper that Ramona Schödel uh, has been working on um, uh, together with, uh, with our team. And uh, she's really an expert on the sleeping behaviors. And if you're interested in that specifically, please, please check it out. It's, it's very interesting. So basically to sum up all I said before, what we learned from those behaviors uh, in relation to personality is that it seems that the personality of people is somehow related to all these behaviors. So where they go, when they do something, which apps they use, which kind of music people listen to and how they communicate and socialize. And so getting to the, to the main uh, story of this talk, uh, what uh, we did in, a, in, in our, one of our latest projects is we want, went the other route. So we wanted to basically use all that information, which we can all gather from, uh, from smartphones, uh, to basically infer people's personality. So instead of using people's personality to see how uh, it is associated with types of behaviors, we wanted to use all that information on these different types of behaviors to see if we can reliably predict people's personality traits. 
So this is a study um, that we have published last year. Um, and it basically combined all the data we collected so far in mobile sensing studies in uh, the phone study project. Matthias mentioned that before. Um, and we had like this huge uh, number of predictors. Uh, it was even larger than that here. That's already the, the reduced set. And we wanted to somehow use that data to predict personality traits. So we had to use uh, a machine learning approach because otherwise it would not have been possible. And what we did is we uh, basically, in, in a cross-validated fashion, without going into any details here, predicted out of sample um, for all the participants in, uh, in our sample, their personality traits just purely based on the behaviors they showed on the phone and in close proximity to the phone. So what you can see on the right side, right hand side, those are the results in, in the Pearson R correlation average now, yes, average, no, it's actually all the Pearson correlations between all the cross sampling faults and um, the actual um, personality trait self reports that people gave us in a, in a lab uh, session or on their phone. And what you can see is that this worked quite well for some of the personality traits, such as extroversion, uh, also openness and conscientiousness. And it did not work at all for agreeableness, for example. For agreeableness, we could never predict above baseline. So we always compared our results before claiming that we can predict anything to a baseline uh, learner that would just you know, predict uh, basically the mean of, of the data. And we can also see up here that um, for emotional stability, it worked sometimes. For some of the facets, those are the personality dimensions that underlie these more broad uh, domains that I, was that I was mentioning in the beginning, it worked quite well and for some it did not. And what you can also see is that uh, the nonlinear random forest models worked much better or they worked be better on average than uh, the linear models that we also used as a comparison. So that's one thing um, to say. Uh, it's interesting to see that it works, um, but what we were actually more interested in is to um, explore what kind of behaviors are predictive of certain personality traits. So if we look into the models, do we actually find what we would expect from personality theory? And here are some examples. Um, sociableness, for example, is a facet of extroversion. We find that people, if they make more calls at night on average, the model will predict higher scores for them in sociableness, which makes sense. And also, Going, going further here on this plot slide, it's getting less and less intuitive. Um, openness seems to be, uh, higher values in openness seem to be predicted if people make more photos on average per day. Uh, conscientiousness uh, seems to be predicted uh, as higher if people check the weather app or weather apps more often at night. And, and the last one, uh, sense of duty, specific facet of conscientiousness, it seems that um, uh, that's that, that we found that quite interesting. That if people wait longer before they unplug their phone from the charging, that the model would say those people are likely higher in, in like dutiful, like so they, they have a better sense of their duties. Yeah, interesting. So um, if you want, if you're interested in those single effects, please don't overgeneralize. Uh, we have a website you can you can reach via this QR code. We have also a companion companion paper uh, that is talking about the methods themselves more more detailed. Uh, but I find these uh, explainable AI or interpretable machine learning methods very useful to not only predict something um, out of sample but also to understand a little bit more and, and create new hypotheses about. Um, uh, about the research we're doing and also to validate the models in a way. This is the, the figure that Matthias mentioned before. I was uh, quite happy to see that in there, in, in the site like a week ago, you know, they were taking some of those individual effects uh, from, from the myriad of effects and were visualizing them in a quite nice way. So um, yeah, if you're interested, I think it's also online on the website of the site. But we were really not satisfied with these single effects because it's really hard to know if they would generalize at all um, because it's so high dimensional. And uh, that's, that's what we thought. We, we actually want to see if there's patterns that we can identify 
as um, as predictive of uh, personality. And so what you see here is you see um, at the top you see all the different models so for all for all the different personality traits. And what you see on the left hand side is a ranking of the most important variables in those models, color coded by the type of behavior. And if you squeeze your eyes a little bit, um, you can basically see those colorful uh, schematic areas in, 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 this, in this plot. So for example, with the extraversion models at the top, we see it seems to be pretty blue. So those are all the communication social behaviors. For conscientiousness, it seems to be rather green, uh, a bit mixed with day nighttime dependency. And for openness on the left-hand side, we see it's all mixed up, maybe orange in a way. So it seems that there is some, some, uh, you know, there's some, uh, some aggregation, or there seems to be certain variables seem to be more important for certain types of uh, uh, criteria in a systematic fashion. And to also, you know, confirm this uh, statistically, because you know, looking is one thing, but then uh, doing tests uh, to confirm this, we ran additional um, importance tests, and what you can see is that. Um, it's not exactly that picture that I was just describing on the left-hand side, because for most of the personality trait, um, um, personality traits, app usage seems to be the most important type of behavior to predict those. Um, just as, a, as an explanation, the grayness, the darkness of those squares uh, is basically um, showing the importance of that category and the red uh, circle, uh, just tells us if it's it was significant in our uh, multiple testing corrected um, hypothesis tests that we used to check the effect. And what you can also see is uh, that uh, as a unique contribution, that's when you fit the model without all the other behaviors. That's the top part. So you can see that uniquely app usage and communication seem to be for the most uh, traits important and if you combine them it also seems that day night time and overall activity so for example screen usage seems to be um, additionally predictive uh, for the traits so what can we um, infer from that uh, from that from that finding so first of all it seems that with some accuracy uh, behavior that we can collect with smartphones allows us to draw inferences about self-reported personality traits it also seems that there are certain types of behaviors and patterns in those behaviors that are differentially predictive of individual traits. And this is what I didn't discuss now in, in the slides, but what we discussed heavily in the paper, this has, ha this has implications for individual privacy because um, apps can very easily collect all those data from your phone in much finer granularity. So we actually didn't look at it you know, at text level or anything, all those things. We had a, we looked at it at the very coarse level, frequencies, durations, variations. Um, and um, I think what we need or what people need, smartphone users need are more differentiated privacy choices because a lot of these companies that are having access to that data, um, once they have access, you know, they can basically do whatever they want. So for a user of a smartphone, it's not, um, it's not clear if you give your data away to enable a certain functionality or if you actually allow them to model your personality and sell you stuff on a website you didn't even know is connected to that data. But it also provides new starting points for research in personality and uh, in, personality, in psychology and in the social sciences. Um, and Challenges, I also have another slide I see. I'm, I'm pretty late already in time, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna fly through this. What's challenging at the moment with, uh, with mobile sensing methods is to actually sense very complex behaviors such as social interactions, dynamics, uh, you know, subjectively perceived situations. It's also difficult to validate some of these measures. For example, if we don't see behavior at night, is that really sleep? It's probably highly correlated, but people could just not use their phone. Uh, we get slightly different data if you use different hardware and software, which is a problem. Um, it's also some, we have to be careful if you do that kind of research because there has been a lot of misconduct happening already on social media data, cam hashtag Cambridge, Cambridge Analytica. Um, 
and also the standards are changing all the time. So Android, for example, is is evolving all the time. You so you have to keep up with with your research uh, software uh, to to have a reliable data base. Outlook. This is the outlook. Uh, I want to work on situation detection and contextualized behavior next. And I also want to see if I can take psychological states from uh, combinations in the data. And maybe doing that in a longitudinal way, which we have also not done so far. And what's getting very popular at the moment is idiosyncratic modeling, personalized medicine. Um, and what I'm working on actually at the moment is to look at, instead of aggregating behaviors on the phone, is to, similar to human language, to take sequences of behavior and try to use them as informative of, informative pieces of, uh, of uh, behavior. Yes, the last point I'll, I'll just leave away. And this is, um, do we have like a, one more minute, uh, Matthias? To, to give you an outlook where, where the research is going, this is from another project in our lab in, in Stanford by Neil and Ram and uh, Byron Reeves and, and their team. Uh, they have developed an app that is not logging the behavior as it happening on the phone. What they do is um, they basically take a screenshot of people's phone every two seconds. Um, and they they have basically, it's it's very, Difficult to say if it's good to do that or bad, but it's very informative about um, people's uh, daily lives and their interests and their needs and all those psychological things that we are typically interested in. But of course, you can imagine those springs along also, um, you know, unclarified and unresolved privacy issues and ethical considerations that play a huge role in in that kind of research, um, both in mobile sensing and, and machine learning and predicting those uh, latent traits. And now it's starting again, which I didn't want to do. Um, and this is my this is my last words. So thank you for listening uh, to my talk. On a side note, because I was talking about personality prediction, we have an open call uh, in future generation computer systems at the moment for papers focused on personality prediction from digital footprint data. If you have something like that in the pipeline, we'll be very happy to receive your submission. Thank you very much. Ja, ganz herzlichen Dank, Clemens, für den sehr informativen, spannenden Vortrag. Wir haben Zeit für Fragen. Wenn Sie etwas fragen wollen, würde ich vorschlagen, nutzen Sie unten auf der Leiste Entweder die Chat-Funktion und tragen da ein X ein oder noch besser die Reaktionsfunktion. Wenn Sie auf Reaktionen klicken, da können Sie eine Hand heben und dann rutschen Sie bei uns direkt nach oben in der Frageliste. Wer würde denn gerne eine Frage stellen?